Hey everyone, my name is Emil Ivov and I'm the founder and project lead of the Chitsi project. Thank you very much for having me today and for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about Chitsi and our mission. So let's start with the basics. What is Jitsi? The easiest way to answer the question is to say, well, this is Jitsi. It is a meetings technology. It is a meetings product. It is the easiest way, I believe, to deploy meetings solutions yourselves and the easiest way to embed them in existing applications. I'd also like to believe that Jitsi is likely the easiest way to conduct meetings themselves. During the rest of this talk, I'd like to show you exactly how easy it is to get Jitsi up and running uh, on your own installation. But before that, I'd like to talk a little bit about our history and our mission, why we do the things that we do. Through its nearly 20 year existence, Jitsi has gone through many transformations. Uh, we have been a messenger, a video phone, a meeting stool. One of the things that haven't changed is that we've always been an open source project. Another one is that we've always been very concerned with privacy. Our accent on privacy started in the late uh, 2000s when uh, we were one of the first uh, communicators to implement support for end-to-end -end encryption with ZRDP. Um, to this day, we are proud to count people like Edward Snowden amongst our users. We've, we've, it, it's been a topic that has always mattered for us. We weren't an isolated case. In the early 2010s, when Edward Snowden made his revelations, in 2013 specifically, many people realized that the new technologies that we were using more and more to communicate were not actually acting in a way we thought they did. We, we didn't have the privacy constraints or guarantees that we thought we had. And so work started on that topic. Famously, the European Union adopted the GDPR in 2016. Many other countries added their own declinations to um, privacy legislations. But I think more and more people felt at this point that their outcomes that we were getting from these legislations were not exactly the ones that we were hoping for. More specifically, while it was clear to everyone that GDPR was now part of the picture, after all, we were all being continually informed about cookies on websites, companies, large and small, had to make sure that they were compliant, which often cost considerable effort. They had to make sure that the right contracts were in place. While all of this was happening, it wasn't obvious that we, the users, had reclaimed our confidence in our privacy being protected on the internet. I believe this became particularly clear in the early months of the pandemic of 2020. We had um, a very substantial proportion of the population move to online communication as their primary tool for activities that were, up until that point, direct face-to-face -face communication. And when that happened, um, uh, there were incident after incident of people finding out that the tools they were using were not really behaving the way they expected to. It was still the same problem that we had in 2013. At this stage, it appeared that we sort of collectively agree that if legislation wasn't going to help solve our problem, then it should probably be technology. And very quickly, people started looking toward end-to-end -end encryption as the solution toward the solution of privacy related issues and concerns. So two after two, Jitsi included, started implementing support for end-to-end -end encryption. This, however, quickly revealed a new issue. Back in the day when end-to-end -end encryption was first 
conceptualized and implemented, the technological world had clearly separated roles of clients and servers. And then there were those who made and provided the clients and those who made and provided the servers and maintained the services. So the way that end-to-end -end encryption was initially working was the following. Um, the entity, company, or community that was providing you with, let's say, your email client was going to encrypt the content of your messages, and then it was going to assert that the other entity, the service provider giving you your email service, hasn't had access to the content of your messages. So there was a very clear division of responsibilities. Again, you have different entities. One of them asserts that the other has not accessed your content. And that's why the model worked. The same was true of real-time communication. You had SIP clients, XMPP clients, whose responsibility was to assert that your SIP or XMPP provider had not had the opportunity to access the content of your communication. Now, enter the 2010s. Many exciting changes happened in the 2010s. We, uh, many of our apps moved to a more web-oriented model and the entire world moved toward the cloud. That had implications for this separation, this division of responsibilities between clients and their providers and then servers and services and their providers. More and more in the 2010s, when you were getting a service, you were getting everything from the same entity. When you're getting email, it, it, it all comes from the same company or, or communities, the servers uh, and or services and, and then the clients that you use to actually read your messages. The same was even more true of real-time communication. One of likely the greatest innovations that has happened to the world of real-time communication was the arrival of WebRTC. It really allowed innovation in uh, ways that were unprecedented up until this point. However, it had the same implication. Now, most entities, whether it's communities or services or uh, service providers, um, when they were giving you the service, they also started providing the way to consume the service. It was all part of a web app, let's say. This poses a serious challenge for the end-to-end -end encryption model. Because rather than having two different entities where one is responsible for vouching that the other hasn't had the ability to access your data, you now have just one entity. And while certainly that entity can give you additional guarantees that there really hasn't been access to your data, this is very far from the original intent of the model. I mean, after all, most providers already do assure their users that their, their data is safe with them. And the whole point of adding end-to-end -end encryption is that, well, we'd like someone else to confirm that as well. That's what we were getting with end-to-end -end encryption in um, the years before we moved to the cloud. And that division of responsibilities is now no longer really practical, no, no longer really there. The conclusions that I personally draw from these experiments with user privacy in the 2010s is that the solution to privacy concerns do not lie in legislation and they do not lie in technology. I believe that we should take an altogether different approach to this issue. During the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas laid the basis to a principle that got later developed during the years of the Enlightenment. That principle is known as subsidiarity. 
And what it implies is that any decision should be taken at the most local level possible. I think that this is how we should be approaching our security and privacy concerns. I believe that the privacy constraints we face are so individual and specific to our different use cases. They're so different, um, even for ourselves, um, depending on whether we're having a work or a personal conversation, that it is very unlikely for global solutions to just emerge, even as, as an enumeration of options. I, I don't think that this is likely to happen. So I believe that the way we can address them is by making sure that we give ourselves the ability to define our privacy configurations. And I think that this is the primary proposition of value that, that Jitsi has, and it fits particularly well uh, with the people in this community. Having your own communication server is likely the, the, the best way to address the specificity of our privacy concerns. And what we work really hard at Jitsi to, to, to achieve is, is to make sure that deploying that solution of your own is a very, very easy process. And we're going to show you exactly how easy it is. So would you please take us through one sample installation of Jitsi? Thanks, Mail. Hey, everyone. Saul here. I want to show you how to deploy Jitsi Meet to your own server. So let's jump right in real quick. Um, first, I'm going to go into our handbook uh, to show you our self-hosting guide. We have uh, comprehensive setups for Debian systems, Docker, and we have a community contributed OpenSUSE um, guide even. Now, today I want to show you the Docker setup because I find it it's the most universal. It's the one that will work with any underlying operating system. So uh, let's go for that one. Um, I have it open right here, and I started like I run the initial steps on, on, a, uh, on a virtual machine. I just want to show you that right here in my uh, Better Call Saul uh, server, nothing is happening. So uh, let's go back real quick to the terminal and fix it up. So here is what we have. Um, we have an uh, OpenSUSE Leap virtual machine and we have a clone of the Git repository that is right here. Uh, here you get all the files. We recommend using stable releases, but I'm uh, running unstable just to maybe show you a cool trick or two. So we're in our terminal, and the one thing that we need to do is customize this file, the environment uh, file where we put some environment variables that configure how uh, the system behaves. We have settings for a lot of things. I'm going to just go through the essentials and we'll go from there. So we need the proper HTTP and HTTPS ports, what public URL this will be working on. And uh, I'm going to use Let's Encrypt uh, to get the free certificate and to have it running like for reals. So this is my, um, my file. Uh, we got Let's Encrypt enabled, uh, my domain here, email. Um, a public URL and uh, default ports. So let's go. Um, all we need to do is Docker Compose up, and this will take care of booting the four default containers, the web container, Prosody for the XMPP server, Gcofo for the conference focus, and the video bridge as the, as the media router. And after all this, um, logs are printed, and the first time you run it will fetch the uh, let's encrypt certificate and so on, you will end up with, uh, well, something like this. And that means that we are ready. So we go back here and boom, we have a working setup. Let's test it real quick. So we can go in there. Hello. And join our meeting. Uh, we already have a bunch of stuff that works out of the box. Um, they're like, you know, 
we can just copy this link, send it to somebody, and they can join our meeting. In fact, if we uh, open a new tab here, um, I'm going to mute though, not to kill the machine in the process. Um, we will be connected with the other end, with the other endpoint. And just like that, we have a very simple setup that we can um, start building upon. On the on our guide, we we have a lot of specific um, configurations that that you can apply if you want to make your setup a little bit more more complicated. So. Yes, in our in our documentation, we do have instructions on how to make your setup more complete and add other services, change your config, and this range from simple things like I want to disable this feature, enable this other tiny feature in the UI, to more you know involved setups for recording, uh, PSTN access, and transcriptions. A uh, popular one, of course, is authentication. Uh, allows you to, in, to use internal authentication or LDAP or job authentication, what have you. Um, and another one uh, uh, is, for instance, shared document editing, uh, which is some Etherpad integration that we have. Uh, so let me show you that real quick. Uh, let's go to the terminal first because we're going to want to stop the, the containers, change our uh, config real quick, and then go back to the browser uh, so we can see the results. So all we need to do is uncomment this Etherpad URL base, and then we need to run um, the Docker Compose with a slightly different command line. This is all documented. So we will spin up a new container that will have Etherpad in it as well. And so now that this is started, we can go back to the website and join a meeting. Now, in this meeting that we're going to join, uh, we are going to now have a new option for a shared document. And here, you know, we can type anything. And now I am going to open a new browser window that uh, you are not seeing <laughs> where I'm going to join the same meeting. Um, let's say I'm John Doe. And I am going to also type some content. And we're going to see how this allows us to, uh, you know, very simply collaborate. There we have it. I'm typing on the other window, and it's just showing up from this, from our uh, dear participant, John Doe, over here. Uh, so that's just one example of more more services that you can introduce in, in an existing setup. But let me take it uh, one step further and, and kind of work with a, with a hybrid uh, setup here where we are going to introduce JAS components. So we're going to run uh, PST and access outside of our setup, but uh, connected to this Docker setup that we have right here. The first step is uh, we need to go into the into our into our JAS console um, to to enable JAS components. Once you go into your into your JAS console, uh, instead of selecting GTS as a service, you're going to select GC Meet components, and you're going to configure your domain over here. So my domain is already configured. We are all set. And then uh, all we got to do is, um, well, obviously, uh, go back to the terminal. And we're going to stop our, our setup once again. <laughs> the idea here is once you configure it, you no longer uh, need to touch it. And uh, we're actually going to disable Etherpad now that um, we have shown it off. And uh, we are going to. Uh, enable JS components. And uh, remember, all we did was uh, some short setup on a website, and then uh, we turned on one flag. Now, what happens um, when we do this? Well, uh, now we, we go back to the browser, and uh, we're going to join a meeting here. 
And once we join a meeting, we are going to see that if we would like to invite someone, there is some new information that shows up here. This is new. We didn't have this. Uh, we have a bunch of phone numbers from all around the world. It is detecting where you are, so we can make a, a, a quick local phone call. I'm going to do that right now, um, kind of close to the camera here. Please enter the meeting ID and press pound. All righty. So... And just like that, we have a new participant. So this is a very simple kind of setup that we came up with to in add this functionality here. The important thing that I'd like to highlight is how it took us very little effort to get started. And then we just kept adding more stuff because everything is configurable and flexible. And you can keep enlarging your setup to be you know, as comprehensive as you want and add the services that you need. And with with things like Just Components, you can run part of it yourself, part of it we can run, and you can kind of mix and match and, and have the a complete setup for your users. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. I think this really makes the point uh, and clearly shows how easy it is to deploy your own meeting server. Um, hopefully the audience is satisfied. We had promised that we'll talk a little bit about features that are going to soon arrive in GT. So let's do this a little bit. Can you tell us what are the, the, the things, big or small, that you're excited about seeing in GT in the near future? Um, well, thanks, Emil. Um, actually, I think that since we are back at Google Summer of Code this year, I, I will take a minute to highlight a few projects that I feel will, will greatly improve Jitsi and have been things that the community has requested for a long time. And we, we could kind of never find a way to do them. And now we have we have kind of found the avenue for them to happen. And I'm hoping all of them uh, are completed to fruition. Um, so, for example, first one I would highlight is uh, different meeting recordings backends. Right now, as um, many of you may know, we can record to Dropbox uh, because we integrate with their API. But we constantly get requests for like, hey, why don't you also record to Nextcloud or some other storage providers, even raw S3 or whatever. Uh, this is a project we are working on on this Google Summer of Code, and we're hoping to make it available um, uh, like make it possible to record meetings in in a in a vast number of of storage backends and should be also more self host friendly because you know you can host your own next cloud and then side by side that you can have your Jitsi for instance and that's actually so that's pretty one cool because side. that uh, actually uh, you know fits really nicely with the idea that people should be able to deploy their solutions that fits their that fit their needs the best so that's pretty cool absolutely. Um, Another one um, is uh, we're going to do a React Native SDK. So those who might be more familiar with our code base know that we are using React Native, but we don't kind of expose it in a consumable way for other React Native applications. We have traditionally catered for native iOS and Android apps in Objective-C and Java, and we're going to packetize it so that it's, it's usable uh, from a React Native app. and this should allow developers to integrate JITS into their React Native applications much faster and much more effectively. There are ways to do it right now, but they are suboptimal and yield to you know certain complex problems. And we're hoping that, that we can solve that as well with, with this project. That's great to hear. And, and last uh, kind of maybe a, hard, a more hardcore one is uh, we want to bring video effects or video backgrounds, uh, that concept to mobile. Um, this this goes down this deep down a number of layers, and uh, we're hoping to lay the foundation at the WebRTC layer, so we can introduce like video transforms at that plane, and then go up so that from an upper layer in the application you can say, hey, uh, blur the background and 
we can probably actually use the same uh, media pipe model that we're using uh, right here on the web because it's available for Android and iOS too. Um, and I'm very excited to start breaking ground in, in at least these three, these three categories. What about you, Emil? What are you excited for? Um, for what's coming? Well, I certainly, uh, I, I'm also uh, looking forward to the ones that you just talked about. I'll probably just throw in another couple. Um, one of the ways in which we, we think about extending Jitsi in, in, in the future, and that's more like more of the distant future, was that we believe that um, the distinction between uh, conferences and then broadcasts is blurring. And, and we'd like to enable people uh, to host bigger events on Jitsi. We currently let people do this to about 500 people. That's what we offer at ABA eight, and what, that's what anyone uh, should be able to set up with their own Jitsi installation. Um, sometimes there's value uh, toward having more people than that. Not that everyone in uh, a meeting with 10,000 people would be able to talk, but some people might. Uh, and, and we think that Jitsi and real-time streaming, sub-second real-time streaming, is an interesting solution to that problem. So that that's something that I'm looking forward to. And then there's there's another one, which is, in general, I think that there's opportunities for meetings applications to help people beyond just providing a new medium, beyond just um, taking your face and putting it on the wire. I think that um, today it it's becoming more and more realistic to have technology help us within the meeting itself to help us, uh, well, um, analyze the image and then um, either improve it or detect important meaningful aspects. Now, when you're talking about analyzing the image that immediately raises concerns, well, who's going to be doing that? Because we started this right. talk with the idea that uh, we, we don't want just anyone having the ability to access our content. And what is really exciting in the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence is that more and more of these things are actually achievable on the endpoint. So what I'm looking forward to is um, our work on solutions that would allow the, the, the machines of the participants, their devices, their computers and their mobile devices to um, look at the images and, um, and help them get through their meetings faster, help them get through their meetings in a more efficient, meaningful way. Uh, this is still very, you know, very much of a um, vague Skunk Works project, but I'm very excited for the potential that it holds. Excellent. Well, I think uh, this uh, concludes our talk for today. Again, thank you very much to the OpenSUSE community for, uh, for having us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us, folks. Bye.